some of the best mixers are ones that also have that inherent musicianship in them because they've walked through that and they know the intent behind when you're writing a song and ultimately you're the one that is carrying an artist's vision of a song inside their head across the finish line, right? You're the one that's making the, the way they picture that huge explosive chorus in their head, you're the one that has to make it feel that way. And a lot of times it goes back to, like we said, curating the juxtaposition from section to section. Huh, what's this red button do? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here we are again, the record process. Myself, Casey Cavalier, Mr. Tom Conran, and Mr. Adam Ackerman, as always. And today, it is part three of our series all about mixing. Woo! And today, that's right, that's right. I love that enthusiasm, because today... <laughs> Today, <laughs> my friends. Hope you add like a crowd sound. Yeah, you're going to need some reinforcement on that, I think, to really Ooh. sell it. Uh, I'm not sure. Ooh. That little... <laughs> um, to really get across how enthusiastic we actually are about what we're going to talk about here today, which is the real uh, magic, if you will, when we are... All the way into this mix process, there is no getting out. There's only one way through, and that's with finishing this track. And this is where it all really starts to come alive. We have our static mix. We have our one-hour mix. We have a, a really solid foundation established for the track, and we're feeling pretty good about it, right? And now maybe we've slept on it. Maybe we're coming back to it, right? Um, you know, with with fresh ears, or you know, even just like taking it, taking a uh, a slight breather, and then picking it back up. And now we're going to start to dive into things like automation and really giving the track and the story that we're trying to tell um, some additional lifts and, um, and and movement here to to really bring the whole thing home and bring it to another level. So the first thing that, you know, is obviously uh, top of mind when it comes to this after we have kind of a static balance of where we like our faders and, and the general soundscape of it, uh, we're we're going to dive right into talking about what uh, what automation uh, we're going to start getting into and how we're going to go about that. So honestly, Tom, take it away, man. Yeah. You are a guy that I, I know has automated once or twice in his day. Tom's pushed a fader once or twice. Yeah, Haven't you, you know, I did the thing. You, you've written... You've written some automation. I've latched some automation. I've touched. You've some. touched? Yeah. Honestly, any automation Tom's creating, I think is touching many. So um, tell us about it, Tom. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so uh, automation, uh, just to like clarify the like our definition, just because maybe you're getting into the mix process. You push up the faders. You're like, great. Everything's working pretty well. It sounds really cool. What do I do? Where's like, my automation plugin? I don't yeah. see it in the menu, right? Yeah, um, I don't think anybody's probably saying that, but just in case it's good yeah. practice, right? Yeah. To, you know, in terms of communicating, and we'll get into that later in the episode and having our diction and words and language, you know, clarified for, for best mixed communication. Yeah, so uh, automation is just uh, the... Different effects, different volumes, different uh, parameters uh, being moved to the determined timeline. So whether your track's on a click track or if it's just in like the sample domain as far as uh, it just being on the time, like timeline instead of like to the click exactly. But... Um, so it's th that process over time. So you can automate pretty much any parameter that you see, uh, EQ curve, uh, the Q factor of an EQ point, uh, the threshold of a compressor. And all of these small movements 
when they are added up, they can really result in a powerful end goal or like an end product. Um, Right. And I think, I mean, what you're kind of getting at too, and I, I start to even draw a parallel back to earlier episodes and earlier ideas and fundamentals of the process when we were starting to talk about things like arrangement and yep. song structure, right? And talking about like tension and release and all mm-hmm. of those like building blocks that we, you know, by this point are very much um, baked into the core of the song and, and should already be giving you some guiding points in terms yeah. of uh, in terms of how the story is built and where you can go. So that's a good starting point, but then that's really what we're use, utilizing this automation, you know, stuff to elevate even further, right? Yeah. And to create some moments in that way as well. So yeah, you know. and, and and so like the the main thing to know about uh, automation is like you can uh, draw it in, so you can point and click and put on different points of automation. Um, but if you have a device to control faders and such, you can. Uh, use the different modes of automation and you can actually perform the uh, the movement that you want. So whether that be uh, you have your fader ri- uh, like riding up and down during a section, um, there's different modes that you can explore, whether that be read, write, latch, or touch, depending on what you're trying to do um, to make that a very fluid performative action. And that's kind of where the uh, you as a uh, artist of being a mixer can really like add that nice subtle touch of flair here and there. That right. like not uh, there's no plugin that can really do that. They can that human element. So Right. And I'm well and I think really what it is is in the same way that you're responding to uh, the idea of music and art in general is to elicit a reaction and have a response and interact with its audience, right? And in the same way, this is where, um, you know, mixing is, yes, uh, it's a a science in terms of balancing frequency, volume, uh, you know, of instruments. um, And it is the technical side of that. But this is really where specifically with things like automation, where I think the artistry and you as a mixing engineer start to put on your performative hat, almost in a sense, and and are able to, especially nowadays in the digital realm, are able to very easy, easily interact with a track and and, and push up the expressiveness uh, of the tracks that are before you. uh, And also you don't have to get it right the first time, right? Um, You can, uh, I mean, with automation again, so you're, you're, mentioning a couple, um, you know, different methods and, and, uh, and obviously like, you know, we, it's worth looking into and I'm sure, you know, there are, there's plenty of good content out there and maybe we'll link to some of it, um, uh, in the show notes here, um, a good video or two, um, that just kind of defines the differences between touch, latch, right, yeah. um, read in terms of automation and stuff. Um, but, uh, generally speaking, it's almost in the same way you're, you can record these movements in real time, just the same way you would record a performance or had captured stuff. So, yeah. so you can actually be like, cool, let me ride this vocal a little bit so that it kind of crescendos just an extra little bit, um, you know, as the, as that section is ending, right. Or cresting and maybe you don't get it right. Maybe, you, maybe you overshoot it a little bit, right. Maybe it's not quite enough. You can just undo and, and, and hit it again, right. Until you get it just where you want it right in that sweet spot and then if need be you can also go back and kind of manually tweak in there as well Mm -hmm. and and draw in the last little subtle differences but um again thinking about it and i know we do uh a lot in the idea of translating especially to i mean with true level studio overall from the beginning it's been very much um you know utilizing the kind of like old school um analog mindset, not only with gear, but just with, you know, from getting it right at the source and and the performance and and the song and everything, but then also not being afraid to use the technology in the digital realm to the full extent and to to the full advantage of it uh, and being able to, to balance both of those. And I think the 
the writing of automation, especially with like, I mean, we've got just like, even just like a simple, like one, like a fader port here, but there's a lot more robust things, um, you know, like it, two faders, eight faders, you can sew a bunch together, 16, 32 faders, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like that, that, that effectively uh, can allow, you know, connect, a, make a laptop, a, a full console yeah. control surface to write automations. Like um, if you, if you so chose to, but I, I think exploring that it, for anybody that hasn't is something that if you're really serious about mixing and about, um, you know, trying to understand why you're not, uh, right. Like the pain point of like, why my mixes just aren't as, you know, as over the top as some of the other stuff that you're comparing it to. And some of the, some of the mixes that you're looking up to, a lot of it has to do with their intuitive understanding of doing those small little micro wides rides on these things. And, um, and really keeping a track exciting because of all these very subtle, bumps and, and, Mm. you know, and and rides and having a control surface or having the ability, again, if you're doing it all analog, that's a way where you can just print and commit stuff down just like they were. I mean, there are, dude, there are great stories that I have even, I mean, any artist that you ask back in, you know, like the sixties, seventies, eighties, uh, and like mixing some of those old school records, it was not cool. Let me write the automation for this one. Great. Let me go back, write the automation for this one. It was great. We get a pass and this mix is printing down to tape right now th- from the board. So I w- I've heard stories of producers where they're just literally like, okay, cool. I've got the lead vocal. I've got this, the drum, the drum bus, and I've got this. I need you to, and literally practicing oh, yeah. the mix process. Yeah. Like, all right, at this section, you're going to bump the guitar, the rhythm guitar fader about 2 dB from this point to this point. And at the end of the section, you're going to bump it down. And the whole band is there at the console that mm. has all of these rehearsed moves to try and get it right. And and, um, and it's, I mean, it, it, when you look at it like that, uh, with like a, literally all hands on deck and just you have to get it right and perform the mix, thinking about it like that is, it makes it extra exciting than just sitting there drawing stuff in all the time and and trying to keep that approach to automation i think is is a really solid um really illuminating idea of how powerful it can be yeah it it kind of adds that uh physical connection to the song that like even if let's say like it's not the perfect choice for that particular section it's the choice that you made in that moment and and like maybe that supersedes having it plus 2 db the entire time maybe like you fucked up and you like slipped and like it bumped it up for that one section and it's like kind of weird but cool great like uh i think the reaction that you get from the like it's the same thing as like going back to like the pre-pro of you get the band in the room and you're doing it live. It's that same energy. You crank up the speakers. You have all hands on the fader, on the faders, and you're creating this live performance piece. And it's something that you, that's in that moment that it's hard to make tangible any other way. Right. And I think, and, and it'll, it calls upon you, um, as as a musician, hopefully, I think this is why you see a lot of some of the best mixtures are ones that also have that inherent like musicianship in them, yeah. um, because they've walked through that and they know the intent behind when you're writing a song, and ultimately, you're the one that is carrying an artist vision of a song inside their head across the finish line, right? Yeah, you're the one that's making the the way they picture that huge explosive chorus in their head, you're the one that has to make it feel that way. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of times it goes back to, like we said, curating the juxtaposition from section to section. And so a lot of that is based on the production and, and how you kind of tailor those arrangements and write the song. But the mix is like, if you have all those things and it's just static from start to start to end, it might just be like, oh man, it just, it feels it feels really flat, you know, like everything might be in good proportion. And like for a live mix, it might be really exciting because you got a crowd, you got an environment, right? Um, You know, people are moving around. 
But in a, a completely sterile vacuum of a set of headphones or, you know, a stereo speaker, you have to work a little bit harder to sell some of those moments. And especially when it comes to, you know, starting with, we talked a lot about balance and, and volume last time, especially starting with the dynamics, you have to maybe sometimes over-exaggerate certain things from a mixed capacity that you might otherwise not have to do. Sometimes just adding a more guitars doesn't make it sound bigger. Sometimes it's it's actually, you know, not adding more guitars, but just a subtle bump or even things, you know, to the extent of we talked about, and this is where it really starts to starts to take off and the, the possibilities start to go endless when you talk about how you can automate almost any parameter yeah. in any plugin. And that really starts to allow allow you to open up a world where we talked about you know, the dimensionality of a mix and, uh, you know, the three, three dimensional access uh, of, of how to manipulate things where imagine if you can automate things to go wider, narrower, higher, lower, yeah, and further away, closer and, and more depth and like automate space, spatial parameters and time-based parameters. That's when things get really exciting because that moment where, man, the whole band kicks in and I want it to go, well, guess what? Great. You add the whole band and the instrumentation changes, right? Yeah. But that's not all you can do with it. You can change the sound and the lane of where things are placed. And you can, you know, how 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 frequency dependent things are. And you can, you can save those moments and you're making all of these decisions based on what's coming next and based on what came before it. And then you can only further punch all, up all those things. And it starts with thinking creatively about how you can use these autom- these automation methods by yeah. looking at what parameters a plugin yeah. has, right? And this this is like for me the part of the process where like a record turns from a good record to a great record. And I think like you know, having looked at your guys sessions and listened to your mixes like you know, hearing the static mix is always like really exciting obviously and it's cool to like hear the vision, but then like once you guys start to add all these movements and all these things that aren't like feasible in like a in like a tangible space, you know, without like physically moving a bunch of things, you know, things that would be impossible to recreate in the real world. Like that's where you guys, that's where like you guys as mix engineers really start to shine is that you start to bring in your level of artistry. And now like that's where this record goes from like, you know, whatever's in my artist brain to like what it can actually be on a stereo system or, you know, five, one, if you feel like getting crazy, but, um, You know, so I feel like this is like a really, really important part of the process. And I think this is where you as a mix engineer can really develop a voice and develop a character that, um, you know, people will really want to work with you with. But I wanted to, I want to ask you guys about like, um, you know, like dynamics in a mix and how you're making those decisions um, to like do certain things. You know, obviously there's a lot of amazing examples out there, but like... um, Talk about, can you guys talk about some examples where like you would uh, like use dynamics in an artistic way, like, or maybe specific artists that like push that kind of boundary? Yeah. So uh, like something to like the juxtaposition of where uh, artists like recorded level versus perceived level that comes from like the speakers or uh yeah either soft to loud or loud to soft is like always a really really interesting thing that you can't physically do and we we kind of brought that up before uh i forget who who brought that up but i think it was like a national track with like uh the piano that was yeah, yeah. very very soft with like just a big groovy drum set behind it and like something that would not be physically possible if you were in that same space right it would sound it would sound just the balance would decidedly be off and you would only have that kind of control by having them multi-tracked and yeah and so like going one step further and like talking about like an artist like Billie Eilish where her voice is down here and she's whispering but the track is like and like it it can get loud and then it can get really soft and that the 
performed volume is soft, but the overall end product is loud. And I feel like that is a really, really cool thing that you can do with Dynamics that, um, as far as like mix engineer wise goes, that's like where that creativity comes into play. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of it, dude, like that, uh, uh, the Billy stuff is, is a really cool example. And I, I've always been such a cool fan of the moment that is, you know, become such a, such a staple in modern pop music where it's this, like a very lush, like production and very full production, but the vocal instead of like a really like soulful belting vocal is such a quiet and intimate vocal that like we talked, you know, about, um, you know, the focus of an instrument and the depth of it, where it's like, it feels like it's literally on top of you. And it's such an incredible moment that if you're listening to a band play, you'll never have that moment. Yeah, the, right? the, the graph of the band is now behind the, so the far picture behind. Of, the, yeah. of the singer. Um, and, and it's incredible, like pulling focus out of like that by using dynamics in, in a way that you can only, that you're only allowed to do in the mix, in the mix part of the process, right? Yeah. It, it, it becomes this final. And even, I mean, Adam, you guys are working on a lot of stuff where you, from the start, are kind of conceptualizing a song, knowing that stylistically where you want to end up mm -hmm. with it, which I think is also really cool because you've seen enough things through to a mix phase and, and worked with some creative mix engineers that have done things like this and presented these ideas. And I think the more people do that, and which is also why I always a firm believer that working with other people and collaborating and trying out new things, you they'll bring out different ideas in your own music that you might yeah. be missing or you might be like, oh, well, I would have never thought about treating my vocal like that. That's awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then that might later on down the line be like, hey, I'm going to write a part that sounds even better like that, that's even more mm -hmm. destined for a treatment like that, you know? Um but that that dynamic stuff is really, um, you know, really crucial in, I mean, it, like, I, I guess a mix, like the whole idea we're talking about capturing music, right, and is bringing essentially a song that if you're talking about, um, you know, like vintage music and, and like old, old school kind of stuff, let's say like an old school big band recording, right? Yeah. You're all in one room, right? So you're getting a lot of the ambient noise and effectively you're taking like a big group photo with a microphone or maybe you have like section mics and whatever, but- It's supposed the, to be that group. It's supposed to be that group. You're, 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 the mic is taking, you're funneling all of that sound and capturing a larger zoomed out picture, right? And nowadays I feel like you have the ability and especially with mixing to- put the vantage point anywhere you uh, anywhere you want and put the listener literally anywhere you want. It, even if it means putting them even potentially in like a three-dimensional way um, yeah. or like a five-point, like a surround sound way, but maybe not even, but putting them directly in the band, directly ne directly inside the kick drum, you know yeah, what I mean? And how, how that affects the song's power and right. the song's arc and like... Does the like uh, an interesting like thought experiment that I really like to do is like at the climax of the song, like if like it's not like hitting in a in like the perfect way, what if the vantage point changed of the mix? Right. Like what what happens there? Like uh, uh, I think like I think it gets associated a lot with like psych rock, but like the Tame Impala stuff, how they like do like that, like, uh, like that kick flip fakey to like, and land in a different space and zone completely for like their bridge or something like that. I think that's a really powerful maneuver that like came out of that experimentation of the late sixties, early seventies, uh, and that creativity of then, put together with the technology of now right. and it just you you have the ability to with a few couple moves and you know some create some creative adjustments pull the rug out and completely change the atmosphere context and spatial you know situation that's that the listeners getting yeah and, and and like going back to like the like the automation portion of that 
the more hands on that you're with like those transitions with like the we'll call it like the world building of where your vantage point is and the ability to turn those knobs and do it fast is kind of I feel like what what sets people apart from yeah. um dumping in stems from anywhere and just putting it through a template. Right. And, and that, I mean, and that's the difference in, in knowing and maybe like recognizing opportunities that the tracks present for you. Right. You know, yeah. it's like, or, or even saying, you know, maybe not that a song is weak, but that it's just like, man, I, you know, sitting there and be like, the balance is here. Like it's, it's here, but it's not, it's not like, it's not making me want to go do a kickflip. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's not making me, it's not giving me that fucking Tony Hawk secret tape energy. Right. Yeah. Um, if we're, if we're chasing this analogy all the way down. Um, and, and what can I do about that as a mix engineer? Cause this is pretty much it, right? This is the last part of the process. Yeah. Right. So you're just like, this is, and which is why it's, it's a high pressure thing sometimes too, because you want to deliver, you know that the artist has high expectations. If it's your art, you've got high expectations. And if it's not coming together at this point, then you're like, well, what do I do? I, I put, thought I did everything I could, right? Yeah. Um, and so maybe it's finding that last way to be like, what, what last tools do I have to pull out to take the vision and my idea and all of the decisions that I've made to this point in order to make something happen and push them one step further or or maybe maybe say hey what if we completely flip it on its end and you can do that with this because of a lot of the technology and, and a lot of processing that you're able to do and if you're able to do that quickly to try something then you're less afraid to do it because a you can always undo if you've done it right and saved other previous sessions and whatever so you shouldn't be afraid to take that leap but um, specifically, if there's an extension of trust with an artist, too, that you're just like, hey, I'm going to like try something here and print two versions of it. You know what I mean? Like, then just be like, hey, I kind of went off into like a, a kind of crazy place. I, I took some like time-based stuff and really like affected the, the drum kit and the vocals in this one thing. It was an idea I had. I think it's cool, but it, it might not be the style. And the band might be like, oh, my God, this is nuts yeah. or the band might be like yo i really like this direction but i think this was just a little too much can we dial that back but everything else is great and being able to forge ahead and do that might be the last thing which is i think how a lot of the stuff you know and a lot of the records that we end up growing to love were sometimes like just mix accidents you know or somebody stumbled on to uh you know little moves bumped a fader or like cranked yeah. a knob all the way up or didn't realize that something was bumped and it got some weird artifact and sound and we'll kind of talk about some of that stuff in a second in terms of like effects and or um you know processing uh intentions that have now kind of become those additional tools and techniques right um but overall thinking about the dynamic contour and knowing where you want to do and that you as a mix engineer have that last bit of power to pull the extra emotive impact out of it with all of these moves, like yeah, and knowing when to use them. That and like, I, 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 I think the one thing to say is like, if you're going into the mix process with still no vision, this is not like, maybe you have to reassess like going into the mix process to refine a vision i think is perfectly great going into mix process with no vision and tr having that solve your song is not the way to do it no and this is why like we said like reference tracks are really really helpful because sometimes if you're un maybe unclear of your final vision yeah this can that this can be a way to help you better define it you know yeah. to be like oh right let's let me let me take some examples of things that hit me really hard in a similar way to the way that i want this to hit people and then go find and then go chase those down right so i think that's um that's also part of it where it's just like if you can establish that or you're really unsure of like where to actually take it then give yourself some targets to try to land and then get as close as you can to those and see if that's the right direction, yeah. right? And at least go in with some sort of goal in mind, you know, um, 
so that you're not just kind of meandering because then you're, you know, sure, you might come out with something, but also you might never actually fully execute any mm-hmm. any direction. Um, and that's that's a tough thing. And that's that's how you get frustrated and you start just like mixing backwards. And yeah, um, and that's never it starts to take the 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 creativity out of it and the flow out of it, I think, uh, a little bit, but yeah. So we talked a lot, obviously, about like the theory and the, and the meaning and all that kind of stuff and the, and the qualitative reasons of like, you know, why to put magic into your, uh, into your setup. But now let's just talk about like some actual, like practical, uh, applications. So like, what are some ways that you guys actually inject some magic into your mixes? Yeah. I mean, uh, I love distortion. Distortion uh, is sick. I distortion and it's uh cousin clipping and it's uh brother saturation. Um big happy family. Very very great, very great family. Great family. Good family to know. Um I feel like uh I mean th- this is really common with guitar. We we talked about this with uh, uh, in depth about in in regards to amps and uh, specifically in regards to the metal genre, um, right. and how it can get emotive. Uh, this pertains; it still pertains in the mixing process. It's just now we have to. Uh, it's not just a guitar. It's all the elements and like how what happens with uh like when you reamp vocals when you put a put a drums through drums through a a, a big muff like or even th- i like, mean even maybe less extreme than that too like talking about like tape saturation oh, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. things like that where like you know, because uh, overdrive and distortion and clipping and all that kind of stuff are great, and they're, they ha- they obviously add a lot of like textural components. But even at their like most mild, they do things like they add compression and they bring out the harmonic qualities of your source. And you want, I mean, we we've talked a lot about timbre on this show, um, and how that is such a critical part to like making something interesting for the listener. So like. This is like that's like probably step one of actually making something really magical to listen to is adding this sort of saturation and you know to even harken back to to like older recordings and things like that where it's like you know you have all these like old heads being like yeah man if you don't have like the real eleven seventy six or you don't have the real tape machine or all that kind of stuff you know you're not gonna get that uh, you know you're not gonna get that magic and the magic that they're talking about is just like the analog circuitry and that little bit of compression and the the little bit of like the funny business that gets injected with uh with everything being slightly different but we live in an era now that like not only have modelers and EQs and things like that become accessible they've become so good that even some of the best mix engineers uh admit to the fact that they can't tell the difference between the plug-in and the real deal so it's like yeah. You know, th- I think that's why that's why a lot of this stuff is so important. It's why people push plugins so hard. It's just because, like, this is a lot... Like, when we talk about injecting magic into the mix, like, this is what we're talking about, is, like, getting unique individual character and bringing out the the cool intricacies and the and the nuances of the things that you're listening to. And, and Tom, I've seen you do some amazing things with distortion. Um, especially, like, I've seen you, like... Uh, crank like 808s through distortion in in ways that like you can't even tell that it's like really distorting but like yeah can you talk a little bit about your process on that yeah um there's a so like you can throw a uh distortion plug in 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 this case let's call it like decapitator sound Decap- toys right. love decapitator yeah. shouts right. out sound toys um it has a couple features. It has it has like the low cut, the high cut, the thump, which is great, and like the tone and everything. But sometimes they're like five distortion plug-in presets, or like the like the presets down at the bottom. Um, sometimes that's not the flavor that you're looking for. So like shaping into the flavor by using an EQ and doing some like 
absurd EQ curves if, again, you're not worrying about uh, phase anomalies with with your with your source, but doing that into a distortion can result in some really cool stuff. So, like, um, let's take a like if we have like an eight oh eight in a song that's in E, we know that E has a fundamental of forty two hertz. Let's give it 30 dB of 42 hertz as, <laughs> as a low shelf and go into distortion and see what that sounds like and like have that and then play with the cue and see what that does to the distortion and how it breaks it. Right. And, and like I think that's the – that's like like let's – we can break stuff and not worry about the repercussions in digital. Right. I, well, uh, unle- unless you're – playing it too loud like don't do it like right crank. things yeah. can be broken yeah. yeah but um but yes like generally speaking it like it's pretty safe which is also interesting enough when you know talking about distortion and clipping yeah and the origins of it right you know what you're emulating aside from i mean the analog setting on any <laughs> on any plugin is essentially just adding noise like yeah. um <laughs> which like if you don't Thanks, know that, waves right if you don't know that like you're like oh it's just magic it's like honestly what it's doing is it's just emulating a slight noise floor and like 60 cycle kind of situation so that's tricking your brain into thinking it's hearing like an analog piece of gear just at base level like it's you know what i mean like sure if you want that which again is where some of this like if you're cranking a distortion or saturating a bunch of things you're naturally adding to the noise floor which your ear if you turn up a guitar amp like your ear is used to that stuff yeah, right yeah. um so it, it makes it generally feel more human sometimes but after a while if you're adding that on every single play it's like it's not doing you any good and it's just clouding up the mix with not yeah. you know musical stuff but if you do stuff like that it allows you to take the musicality of things into another another domain and actually emulate that kind of energy just like if you had a vocal that just blew up a preamp mm-hmm. you know then again we get back to talking about what we were, were just on a second ago implied dynamics right where you're just yeah. like hey that's implying that it's a really hot signal that's like crushing a preamp or just like diming like a limiter or something, you know, like, and distortion and saturated and even clipping. It's like, if you hear it, like the musical end of clipping is literally like the top part of that signal is getting shaved off because it's just, it it's not capturing it anymore. You know what I mean? So like um, when your ear hears that, it perceives a certain thing and especially the addition of that and the same thing with distortion, it brings out, yes, those harmonics because you're crushing everything into a ceiling and it's and it's amplifying this weight. Um, and if you want to do it in a musical way, that's a great reason and another great um, point where if you're sending these things out, you know, we can, fi- most, most people can figure it out, but like that's why the BPM and even key of the song and the information is relevant because a good mix engineer is going to take the musical elements um, and parameters of a song into account. You know, it's like they're going to want to put it on a grid or put whatever like timeline behind it so that they can play to it and know, cool, in this key, like, great, let me see what my kick is tuned to. Well, if that's the case, then I'm going to make sure if I have to underlay a sample of some sort, I'll tune it to the song so it sinks in really nicely musically instead of being like, okay, great. My snare, the sample that you're using is technically pitched to a tritone in the key. That's not going to sound super musical and it might be rubby, but you'll never, like, you can battle for days trying to get that sample to sit in the right place in the mix and it just won't. Because of the tuning of it, you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, like, yeah. Um, so it's things like that that really that that do matter and and all need to get taken into account. But why things like that? Um, when especially when you get into a lot of like plugins and <clears throat> processing that are meant to emulate these kind of effects, mm-hmm. it's really important to like know how to use them, even though you know. Sometimes you can just turn it up and go for it, but yeah. you understand and, what it's trying to do yeah, and what and, you can do with it. Yeah, what it's emulating. So, like, no, know, knowing that, uh, like, for example, like, what the, like, what's the deal with tape? Like, what? Honestly, 
What is the deal with tape? So, like, you tell me, I, Mr. Conran. I, so, like, resident <laughs> tape expert Tom Conran. That's right. Tape. I mean, I think I know, but I probably don't know as well, well as you do. So, uh, yeah. So, like, uh, you see all these different speeds, and like the speed. Uh, so you see like inches per second IPS. So there's like thirty, fifteen, seven, and uh, seven and a half. And then three for and anybody three that just has like Kramer tape or like one of that yeah. emulations, like and have never actually seen a tape machine. That's yeah, it's you know, and, and so like you'll notice that if you turn the speed down, your your the top low. well your top end gets kind of like filtered out. But the other thing to consider is that your low end extends down an octave, so. Like everyone, uh, you hear of these guys that are like, oh man, 15 inches per second, man, the low end. Mwah. My or like, drums yeah. are just. And, and like, or, or seven and a half. And then like you throw that plug in on and you're like, man, where's my top end? Like what's going on here? But little did you know, they're just like cranking EQ into it to get that right. top end back. Right. Um, or after. And so like, so but, they're getting a lot of extra saturation up there because it's it's controlling it. So it's yeah. it's using combinations, which we'll kind of get into next in terms of like, I mean, I love there's there's a few moves in terms of EQ and things like that that yeah. are, um, you know, understanding the you know the curves of the gear and what the knobs are actually kind of doing yeah. and how they're doing it um, that can be really useful. Uh, to go beyond it when you start combining these chains into like, why am why is this person putting like two different EQs right after right next to each other, or why are they putting two compressors in a row? Yeah, you know, like uh, yeah, I like, don't get it. Uh, yeah, um, well, there's there's a reason because they know exactly what both of those compressors are doing, and they're doing different jobs, right? Yeah, and like go like the one that you hear everyone do is like the Poltec trick. And like, well, you you can and for for those who are unaware, like the pol the Poltec trick is that like you can boost and cut at the same frequency on both the top end and the low end, but the um, the low end uh, the boosts are I I believe it's some like tube compensation gain circuit. Whereas the uh, uh, reduction is an inductor base. So you get a phase differential when you boost and cut at the same. So you get a, a wacky, like, boost cut dip at, like, around the frequency that you're trying, that, like, you, you actually selected. So, like, it makes a cool carve out, carving out moment. You can, like, kind of do that in the top end as well with the, with the thing up there. But, Anyway, we, we can discuss that uh, maybe some other time. Right. But, um, but like, people use that EQ just for that low-end trick. And, like, even though it has a upper octave, like, band that you can use, knowing that that gear is built that way, it has that secret sauce that you can pull out Right, if you need that trick. Right, and I mean, I like another thing I I always see and I, and I kind of love, but is like a when you know you know, but before you do, you you'd just be like, what? Uh, that's insane. And you watch, um, you know, guys like uh, like CLA, right? Like if people are watching a lot of like Chris Lord Algae videos online, he does a lot of stuff with with Wave Slate, like a lot of like mix mix run throughs. Obviously, his catalog is is nuts. If if you're a rock fan, you've heard so much of his work and probably don't even know it. Um, and he, he works on an SSL, um, and uh, typically, um, and you know, which is a board that has, um, you know, a very specific, often like pretty sought after like industry standard, um, set of EQ pots on, on each channel strip. And, You'll watch him and, you know, if, if, for anybody that's, like, new to mixing, you're like, oh, man, like, you know, just being subtle or, like, I don't want to go too hard. Like, maybe I'll just increase, like, 3 dB, 6 dB here, whatever. And then you look at him and he's just, like, cranking the high-end um, shelf EQ at, like, 
8, 8K or whatever. And you're just like, you do that and then you do that on your mix and you're like, wait, oh my God, like why? Like this sounds horrible. Yeah. What, like why? And what? And it's like, oh, but you don't realize that he's using the low pass filter and bringing the low pass filter in at almost like at like eight and a half or nine K right mm. above where that is. So it creates this very unique slope off and roll off. Yeah. Instead of boosting everything above 8K, uh, you know, all the way out. And if you don't know that, but then this has, it has a very musical way of rounding out the high end slope so that you get a really exciting boost, but it's not overly, overly airy or overly like insane. And it's things like that, which is like similar to like a pull tech move that you would never know, or some people will emulate that kind of thing with two EQs in a row, right? Yeah. Um, and, and and choose them very, very carefully. Or even with some sort of distortion where they will, you know, you throw decap on, but you might only like blend in a little bit of it, right? Yeah. And just use it subtly. And then I've even started doing, it's like, I'll throw decap in to give it like a really, like just add a little mid-range saturation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or like like mid thing like say it's a kick drum right and you want a, a little bit of mid-range knock so that it, it it feel it hits a little a little harder and feels a little bit more connected to the song um you know like on a phone headphones whatever but then i'll i'll put in another saturator behind it and i'll i'll boost some air on it you know what yeah. i mean or on the samples so that it still feels like it has like a mm -hmm. to it um but not overdoing it, right? And so, it, but it's in line. And so it, they're each, each one of these things is just doing a little bit of the work instead of having one plugin. And this is like some, a really good advice that I wholeheartedly stand by. If you're mixing in whatever DAW, or even if you're, you know, you're mixing with outboard gear or whatever, you can get a very specific effect by having one piece of gear do a ton of work and at a hundred percent and doing um, a crazy amount. But think about what you want. And if you want something a little bit more subtle or more musical, can that piece of gear uh, be one of two pieces of gear that, you know, in line with each other or split it into two plugins and that do half the amount of work? And can you get a similar effect? Can you get an even more unique effect yeah. out of it, right? Um, and maybe something more musical or something by doing that gives you more control and more options to get to where you want to go. Yeah. And um, I mean, that I think that's like a really important idea too to get on in terms of like processing chains and, and yeah, you know, for sure. Chains. Yeah, so like distortion. We definitely, co I feel like we definitely covered a lot of that yeah, gambit. Yeah. yeah. Um, I feel like another tool that like some effects that like give life are talking about like how we are affecting the spaces that the effects that we're using live in so like whether that's like the gated reverb of the 80s or that's the ultra compressed room of uh, this really tight room uh sound that like in my mind I associate with like an Eric Valentine in the early aughts. Right. Really um, exciting drum performance that feels like the drums are just yeah. throwing energy out into a room. Yeah. And so like how we affect those different elements of that space that we're in to convey energy it, it by stacking a couple different um plugins or uh, pieces of gear on top of each other and utilizing them in such a way that apart they may not work um so like th the gate may not be the perfect uh tool for the job nor the reverb may not be the perfect reverb for the job but together oh my god it's it's the sound mm -hmm. um so case give me like with the with this like parameter right what like if i'm like give me a cool like reverb trick that reverb or like drum room 
because I feel like drum rooms are like a uh, kind of an important important thing to give the listener a oh, like, definitely uh, a uh, cue to the space that like the mix and the the world of the a hundred percent. Well, and so we t- so. What's really cool, what's cool about um, specifically drums in that they're like defining the space. And a lot of times, like if you think about like what you're going for with a mix, are you going for like, do you want people to think band on a huge stage in an arena? Do you want to think like band in a really tight, dry room with like that really pent up energy? Um, Or do you want, you know, do you want something that feels weighty and feels, you know, immersive in that, but you want life you know you want one instrument to pop out or everything to have its moment right um you know and that's part of not only like bringing this instrument up for a second or you know nudging this lead up here or whatever but specifically and you talked about um eric valentine who if you guys are not familiar um incredible mix engineer producer he's also done a lot of phenomenal records he actually does a great series called making records uh that he started doing and also uh awesome uh technician a hundred percent he's or, or uh, like a genius designer. when it when yeah. it comes when it comes to um gear outboard gear and um and studio uh studio techniques for sure um but so um you know thinking about uh, like some of the things that he has brought into his drum process or even the way that he that he thinks of it and a lot of these are you know are productions that he tracked but maybe sometimes they aren't And understanding that, you know, over the course of a song, the drums are keeping the rhythm, keeping a pulse, but also are in their own way, even though a drummer might be really like, you might want to consistently like knocked, you know, um, you know, really smacking the shit out of them all the way through uh, just to get the most out of the drums and consistently then that leaves you with the with the charge of okay cool well i'm going to have to like give a little bit of push and pull and finesse to the drums and one of those ways is with capturing if you if you have a really solid sounding room or even just like good area mics or whatever is understanding that you can put a drum make it make the emphasis and impact of a kit and certain whether it's a fill or certain transitions or certain grooves <clears throat> move forward at you, backward at you, or expand, um, you know, up, down, left, right um, in the space. And one of the things I love to do is, um, you know, the more you compress a room, the more you hear the room sound um, and the more you hear the detail come out. And um, so if we, you know, for example, he'll he'll take rooms a lot. He'll obviously process them, you know, and and get them almost to like pump a little bit But sometimes they might be a little reserved, but I I will sometimes occasionally either if it's just automating for a big drum fill, not only will I automate like the snare up or say it's like a big catin, catin um, right before, you know, like a chorus or as a transition moment. Maybe it's a, it's a, maybe it's just a drum break fill. Um, I'll not only maybe automate the whole drum bus up like a DB to give it a little extra pull, you know, pull it forward and, and, and punch it out for a second before it drops in with the band. But I'll also do things where I maybe increase the compression on the rooms yeah. for a second, you know, like turn down the threshold or or turn up the ratio or mess with something um, or even blend in if I have like a really like crushed, you know, we've done like the butt mic or yeah, you know, a really yeah, crushed yeah. mono mic. Maybe I will bring that sound up in the kit to give a little extra impact or pull out a little extra excitement from the rooms and overheads or, or whatever it is. And that's even a subtle move where I'm using maybe a chain, maybe a chain in parallel, right? Um, you know, that um, maybe I'm increasing uh, if I if I have a parallel, like, Drum, like parallel compression bus on my drums that's really like pumping the shells and it has a lot of extra smack and <clears throat> and top end excitement which sure like you're probably doing like a really gnarly eq move into where you're like boosting low and high like a little smiley face thing or whatever into a very heavily you know heavily working compressor or or multiple um maybe i'll i'll pull that bus up like to db or whatever yeah. for that fill so you get even more of the attack and snap in that fill 
to hit you for that one moment, but then the rest of it can sink back into a natural place when, when the rest of the band comes back in. So I love working with like room and area mics like that using different compression, or even if it's a thing where maybe I'll automate an EQ to just have a slight top end boost, Yeah, you know, so you get a little more air in a moment where if it's, you know, depending on the part, if it's cymbals or if it, if it's too much cymbal, maybe I'll have to automate that part down to, to, you know, sink in if he's really destroying the crashes and, you know, at a certain yeah. part, then maybe I, I can do that, but that'll all help it instead of having that stick out unnaturally. So, yeah. And actually that, that, that brings me to like a move that like, uh, is a really, really awesome vocal move um, for, like, compression and reverb. And, like, reverb. And it kind of, like, brings us into, like, my next favorite portion of the effects is the movement that you can give it. And Mm -hmm. um, there's this uh, this, uh, Australian author, and Casey brought him up before, The Mixing With Your Mind. Um, Great book. Um... Uh, has a lot of very cool heady concepts um, about mixing and how you can affect the sound and translate what's in your head to what's coming out of the speakers. But uh, the one that the one technique that like has always stuck out with me, and I feel like I, I've been able to use it with very effective, uh, like good uh, effectiveness. Um, with really, really fantastic singers. Otherwise, it's it's a little harder to... Singers that don't have as much dynamic control with their voice, this technique doesn't really work as well. I just have to say, if it's what I'm thinking of, the picture that accompanies this... Oh, um, yeah, it's great, it's great. ...description in the book, if anybody looks it up, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's pretty twisted and kind of makes you feel a little bit weird uh, when you look at his like uh, weird drawing. Adam, have you seen, do you know what I'm talking about? Seen, uh, oh my God, you should look at it. Um, yeah. yeah. Hey, um, so like this process is uh, if you think about a vocalist in a room, the room is going to get excited by the voice itself. So if you go ahead and throw a compressor on your vocal chain and then you send a uh, reverb send off of that aux track that uh, say or off of that compressed vocal signal you're going to get a compressed vocal going into a reverb so it gives you a certain type of sound your vocal is always going to be pretty forward and when the big moments are big the vocal will be dry and kind of right there and the reverb will kind of just be the same as it ever was or even just a little bit less because you're sending a compressed signal into right. the reverb. Sometimes that's exactly what the song calls for. Other times, if you have a vocalist who is just uh, can hit the high notes, hit them with such intensity and um, beauty and then get really quiet and then come in and you want to capture that movement. The technique calls for sending the uncompressed signal of your vocal to this reverb and then compressing and then combining them. So you get this effect where you have a vocalist, say, in a room that the sound comes out, blooms into the room, excites the room, and then they kind of disappear into the room. And then when they're very quiet and soft, they're a bit forward and the room's kind of like hugging them around. And it's a very, very cool technique. And again, sometimes can be the wrong move for, uh, particular vocalists um but for again for really dynamic vocalists it works wonderful right and there's also there's there's ways that you can if need be try to achieve that with automating reverb for sure for sure you know it's like but that is like a really nice organic way of thinking about something and treating it um so that 
you let a performance uh, interact with the track and the rest of the mixes yeah. and, and, and make those moments um, more so than trying to like sketch out and control and define every little mm-hmm. thing by your own hand. So I, I, I do love that. And and like that that same mindset can be applied to drums and like you hear uh, people sending only like drum samples to the reverb. So it's a consistent pop where they get the dynamics from the... Right. Um, uh, when from the actual live players and totally valid. That's totally awesome as well. Um, right. Well, and also too, and so we were just talking about this. I, you know, I, I sometimes call and do this and we'll either like trigger a room sound for a consistent room sound. If I, if the, I didn't love the room sound that I got for whatever reason, um, or I'll even just, you know, supplement it if I like the room sound, but you know, there's a little bit too much of the symbol in there. So I want to boost a little bit more of the space, but without the symbol stuff if it wasn't like separately tracked i know some producers will track shells and then metallics separately so that they can do this um but uh if if that's not what you have um then you can control it and find a sample and sometimes what i'll do is i i will run the right sample or maybe i will trigger um you know the samples that i took of the dry you know the dry samples that i took um that i will just run them and so that they're naturally triggering and reacting to the dynamics of it um but you're not getting any cymbal bleed or hi-hat bleed yeah. in what you're sending to a reverb you're just getting the snare sound and you're sending that you're triggering that and that is going to a hundred percent you know room sound yeah um or reverb or like you know nice nice weighty compression thing so effectively you're building your own drum room sample yeah but it's controlled and you're taking the symbols out of it. And then in context of it, it sounds natural because it's that snare or it's a sample that's not like, doesn't sound overly phony. But even in the context of that, you're just using it to trigger and get the room excitement and react to it, you know? Yeah, and, and um, uh, I've been currently like real in love with uh, the XL, uh, XLN audio addictive uh, trigger. Um because it has like the kick versus the overhead versus the room sound, and like mm-hmm. you can do all this crazy cool stuff, and like yeah, and it's it uh, having the ability to create that space with these uh, single elements to either uh, make up for the lack of space or just change the perspective if you need to change right. the perspective. And I mean, and, and that's the kind of thing too where I'll, you know, not only like kind of do little rides or whatever, but yeah, I'll like bring up, I'll bring in the rooms or bring down the overheads a touch in verses where I want a tighter sound. Mm-hmm. And then I will bring them out for choruses or big moments where I want a bigger, weightier sound to match the fullness of a band. Right? Yeah, I, 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 like a uh, perfect example uh, case. We were just working on this like pop production and like there was three different room mics. Right. And uh, it worked out that the room mono mic and the room far mic worked really well for the choruses and the verses was just the whatever the room near was. Right, right. Who knows? But, like, it wasn't the room mono. Yeah. But, um, that's a way to differentiate these spaces, too, which exactly. is part of the beauty of this, of this, you know, thing where you've done that through the composition and through the arrangement, but this is your chance to, like, do that sonically, too, and spatially and harmonically um, as well, so. Yeah. Um, I, so, like, there's a couple different uh, there's a couple different ways that we can also add movement. So like the even tide stuff, um, just so cool. They they have so many cool aspects and like parameters that like just like take the uh, take the mix or take whatever sound and like launch it into that perfect like uh, sonic territory that you're like. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, right, and I want to. I, I want to put my snare into a black hole. Of course, I do. Yeah, uh, yeah. Right, and I mean, there's like an Aptly endless. Named. I mean, Adam, you know, also as like a guitar player and and multi instrumentalist and uh, guru of effects pedals. Um, you know what I mean? Like, there you can just play with these things endlessly, and effectively, you're you're making like these 
effectively, like as a guitar player, you're almost doing what we're talking about now and adding these extra sauce character things from section to section, but with a pedal board even too, you know? Yeah, and like, you know, especially when it comes to like doing a mix down, I mean, the the thing that really comes to mind to me uh, is like on Blink-182's Feeling This. Like that drum opening is really cool, but then you slap a flanger on it and all of a sudden it's iconic, you know? And obviously the the drum flanger goes back to the 70s recording and psychedelics. Or like, you know, even when we talk about movement in records, you know, looking at um, someone like Jimi Hendrix who would like to sit at the board himself and uh, and pan his guitar left and right when he felt that it needed more movement and things like that. Right. Um, all of these little things are what's creating these sort of like you know, uh, these emotional moments for for the listener where, like, again, that's not something that can really happen in real life. I would love to see Jimi Hendrix, like, put a, a Marshall stack on a crane and fly it over a crowd. But that just wasn't realistic, you know? Um, so it's I don't know, cool. man. There might have you some. That's like some, uh, some front of house engineers were doing the same <laughs> drugs that the bands were back then. You know exactly. what I mean? Like, so it, know, probably some of these happen. conventions are. You know, I mean, and I've even had conversations with our front of house guys where talk about moments where I'm just like, hey, can for this like, can you just do me a favor and just like pan this like say it's like a mono synth pad. Just give me like some movement back and forth when it starts. Right, exactly. So it feels, especially if you're in a club, so it feels a little less just stock. Right. You know, like so it so it feels like there's something a little bit more happening and there's a, a subtle um, you know, wash to it. Yeah. And and I mean we talk about movement too. I mean, Tom and I have done this in pop productions before where like we'll take a, you know, a um a steady, like, constant signal, and we'll either automate it via, like, a, a side chain bus to, like, a kick drum or something like that, or even we'll take, like, a tremolo uh, and, like, have it pump to the music. And right. all of a sudden, like, this movement is now coming out of this this instrument that's, like, becoming more a part of the song, and it's giving it more purpose. And, like, you know, even doing crazy things with, with you know, automated panning and, uh, you know... Um, it, uh, you talk about expansion as well. I mean, um, uh, who is it? Isotope makes that amazing, uh, what is it? The Ozone Imager 2, uh, the Ozone yeah. Image 2 or whatever, where like that's a, you know, that's a spreader plugin or whatever. So it's it's like adding um, delay to either side of the signal so that it feels as though it's, it's stretching in width. Um, and these are cool things that you can do like when you're going between sections of songs or you're creating you know, uh, moments within like certain sections of a song where it's like, if you want the listener to feel as though they've entered a new space, there's all sorts of different ways to accomplish this sort of right. thing. And all of that comes through like this automation. And that's when you get to like really mess with the listener's mind really and and throw them some unexpected curveballs. Or a, uh, a plugin or a series of plugins that automate it on a level at which... Uh, is almost like unrecognizable to like uh like you couldn't possibly be doing all these things at once so like uh right. like uh a plugin that comes to mind is like the Abbey Road Chambers plugin that has the overdrive it has the filter circuit it has the steed which is a uh, we talked about this before where it's a it's a low frequency oscillator on like a warble, like, yeah. and doing like a tape delay and then reamping into a chamber. Right. Like, and I think, and especially in the digital realm, like, so many of these things are ultimately bringing in subtle imperfections. You know, they're like, whether you're randomizing a part of the process or making it l just less sterile because there's things that are constantly popping up or, cr or cropping up to the ear that like aren't distracting, but are new, right? And, or are, you know, are making differences between the left side and the right side. And, oh, this section sounds a little, this first verse sounds a little bit different than the, you know, second verse or, you know, whatever. Um, and it's maybe because of not just the instrumentation, but because of the treatment or be, you know, and, and that's why I say like, ultimately you're amplifying everything in the vision that has been put in there through tracking. So if you feel like 
And I'll sometimes do this too. And, and don't be afraid to experiment and with conventions and think in each one of these parameters when it says, okay, what can I manipulate? What can I change to make this more colorful? Well, you can change the width, you know, like all three, the X, Y, Z axis that we kind of talked about. You can also change, you can change and manipulate the pitch. You can change and manipulate time. You can add time-based elements and use the rhythmic things in there um, and supplement them through delays and reverbs, draw them out, gate them de- gate them off, right? Um, and even create new sounds and instruments just based off, I mean, I love, dude, if it's like a slow, like, <clears throat> like putting, throwing like an echo or delay situation on like a drum, on a snare drum, mm-hmm. you know, like, uh, I mean... Uh, who's the drummer from the police that does that all the time? Uh, I can't think. It's it's either Stuart Copeland or Scott Copeland. I can't it's remember. Stuart Copeland. Stuart. I believe. Yeah. Um, uh, ama- amazing drummer who like sort of pioneered that sound too. Like had a space echo like next to his drum set, right. had it all mi- mic'd up. And then like in doing so created like other rhythmic textures. And even, even on my solo record, we did that, Tom, where like yeah. we put um, delay on like these three drum takes that we did. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in in tandem to create like more rhythmic layers that like otherwise couldn't exist in a in a you know acoustic space. So. And you can reinforce the groove. You can put that put that delay slightly behind the beat to pull mm-hmm. the feel of everything just you know back in the pocket. Or yeah. you can put it like a delay that's kind of rushing ahead that gives you this like this tense an- anxious like feeling. You know, yeah. yeah. Or I've like d- I've even done that with hi hats too, like right. in pop production, where like if I want something to feel as though it's subdividing further, instead of adding like a full. Um, you know, new hi hat sound or something like that that has a has a greater subdivision to it. I'll just add a delay that's doing that subdivision, and the the characteristics of the way that it like tapers or the way that I have that delay saturated and things like g- is going to give you ultimately a different experience than if you were to just like play it regularly, right? And it fills the space, but with implied additional content or texture, just like. If you're adding reverb to an element, it's stretching out that harmonic content there from that instrument across more layers. So that note from the vocalist that they lean into like, oh, shit, he just like dropped down to that like major seven for a second. But now instead of it just disappearing, it kind of floats there and sustains and gives you that rub over everything when the chord changes. Like those are the moments that, that um, you know, in the mix process, you can do in, in manipulating it to create extra special moments that wouldn't otherwise be there. And and all you have to do is really just like get creative. And every time you dive in, think about, hey, what can I fuck with here to create a yeah. moment? Or, hey, what does this need? And say, it's like, it needs a little bit extra rhythmic umph. Well, then pull out some of your time-based stuff and see what instrument in there needs to be amplified. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, exactly that. Um, I I do have a like one parting thought on on this whole subject of like movement. What would you like to leave us with, Tom? So, uh I know Adam is big into math. I'm big into math. Math is great. Case can't speak to you. Casey, uh, I mean, they're here nor there on math. Is very indifferent about math. Yeah, no, is uh, you know, functionally necessary from time to time for sure. Uh, the, the I have no th- hate on math. The, the, the thought that I want to leave people with, with thinking about like, if we're thinking about the mix in like an X, Y, and Z right. plane, is figuring out like the derivative of what you're doing to, so like when you derive, uh, you can derive elements to boil them down to a simpler and simpler equation or right. so on and so forth, kind of like that. But uh, w- like velocity derives into acceleration, that kind of stuff. Um, what does your effects do and how do you derive those effects into the meaning of what the song is and I don't want to give any like answers. I think it's a, a personal exploration, like a thought experiment that like you can do if you have uh, if you have these elements in your mix 
and you're like, why am I doing this? What's, what's the reason behind that? And where does that go? And I, I feel like that, that kind of gets us into the next episode of the ear candy, the decorations and like getting weird and that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. No. And, and that's, I mean, I think that's a great way to treat any mix process in terms of like really understanding and trying to connect yourself with the song as a mix engineer, not just like say, okay, cool. Technically speaking, I have to, you know, move the faders until it sounds okay. Like really understanding what the song's about, what it's trying to do, what it's trying to make you feel and trying to embellish that and think about how you can embellish that, right? Like if the song's about running water, how can you, you know what I mean? Like what can you use to almost like carry further that like like there's like almost like word painting esque moments yeah, in a exactly, sense of like exactly. cool well like where does that take your creativity if listen to the lyrics and maybe that'll give you a mix idea you know maybe that'll give you an idea of an effect to use you know or i mean maybe it's something as simple as right this song is <laughs> i don't know well hopefully it's not but if it is uh clocks by coldplay cool then maybe like something uh rhythmically i might pull out uh some sort of like echo or ping pong situation and and throw it in there to to represent some element of time. Yeah, I don't or know. like uh, <laughs> Adam, we we've been uh, chatting it up about the My Chemical Romance album, uh, Welcome to the Black Parade. Fabulous record. Uh, that record has a whole bunch of like hospital beeping, right? Uh, and uh, how that plays into the the opening line from. Uh, the song dead right and like it's kind of flatlining and like it, there's a whole bunch of cool elements and like metaphorically speaking and that's when like that's when the ear candy becomes part of the story part of the yeah. story right. exactly yeah. right which is why I think next episode is going to be awesome and that will be um will be certainly something to look forward to uh, for us, but hopefully everybody else, as we've just thrown a lot um, to digest uh, in terms of this. But as always, if you have any questions or we clearly love talking about this kind of stuff, right? Um, And uh, are happy to continue the conversation outside of these episodes and and look forward to doing it. So if you have any specific questions, right, um, feel free to reach out to us uh, as usual, uh, via the studio email or on Instagram. And- TrueLevelStudio at gmail.com or at TrueLevelStudio. Wow, look at wow, you. Wow, look at plug that. It. Look at that. Gotta put the plug Pluggables. in. Pluggables. Um, well, you heard it there. Um, so no excuse. You know, where, that, that, you know that, where to go. That's a certified glad pluggable. That's right. What? That's right. Like, <laughs> like the, the, the scent fresheners? Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. and on that note this has been fun and we hope you had as much fun as we did and we will catch you next time on the record process see you guys bye bye Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for sticking with us here on The Record Process. Uh, Don't go anywhere. I know it's been taking a little while longer to get these episodes out to you, um, but we still have a lot of cool stuff in store. Uh, On the next episode, we're going to start getting into talking about decorating our mixes with little ear candy things and and how to take things uh, up even one more notch uh, with little sound design moments and and throwing little Easter eggs throughout a mix. So if you haven't already, definitely subscribe. So whenever we do get the next episode out, you won't miss it. And in the meantime, as always, if you want to reach out to any of us, all of our information is in the show notes, uh, including email or whether you want to hit us up on Instagram, uh, all that information is there and we will catch you next time on The Record Process.